This video provides an introduction to interpreting mass spectra. We will focus on spectra produced by electron impact ionization in this lesson. Spectra used in this lesson were taken from the NIST Mass Spectral Library and were used with permission. The vacuum chamber where ionization takes place contains a heated tungsten filament. Below this wire is an electrical plate. A voltage of 70 electron volts is applied between the filament and the plate. The electrons escape the filament and speed toward the plate with a kinetic energy of a 70 electron volts, an energy that is far greater than the ionization potential of organic molecules. So if we introduce a gas phase molecule into the chamber so that it drifts into the beam, a collision with one of these electrons will knock out an electron from the original molecule and produce a positive ion. This collision is usually so violent that even after losing the electron, the molecule is left reeling and often breaks apart. If a single bond breaks, the positive charge remains on one piece and the unpaired electron ends up on the other. Usually the molecule fragments in multiple pathways. Occasionally both charge and unpaired electron remain on the same piece. In order for this to happen, two or more bonds must break in the process. This will be very important to us later. Since all of our mass sorting strategies involve manipulating the charged fragments, we never are able to observe the neutral pieces directly. Our mass spectra will only show peaks from these charged fragments. If we are lucky, we will still be able to observe a signal from the original molecule or parent ion. We will occasionally refer to the fact that the parent ion has an odd number of electrons. Other odd electron ions that appear in the spectrum will be especially useful clues to determining the structure of the original molecule. We'll come back to this idea in a later lesson. Usually the main objective in interpreting a mass spectrum is determining molecular structure. Getting from the spectrum to a structure amounts to solving a puzzle. Puzzle solving is an art. People have their own strategies, but most chemists follow this general approach. First, determine a reasonable molecular formula. Then, draw possible structures for that formula. Then, predict what fragmentation products will be produced for each candidate structure. Finally, look for evidence for the predicted fragments in order to decide which structure fits best. This lesson will concentrate on the first step. Let's take a look at a few simple mass spectra and attempt to interpret them. The single most useful peak in the spectrum is associated with the molecular ion. Let's assume that the peak at 26 mass units is the molecular ion. The molecular ion is not always the tallest peak in the spectrum. However, we know that it must be at the high mass end of the scale. We're going to assume that we're working with organic molecules in this video. What organic molecule has a molecular weight of 26? Pause the video a moment, and when you have an idea, go on. Most chemists would reason this way. We know that an organic molecule has at least one carbon atom. Carbon has an atomic mass of 12, so one carbon atom would account for 12 units, so 26 minus 12 leaves 14. Nitrogen weighs 14 atomic mass units, but CN is not a realistic molecule. Let's try two carbons. They would account for 24 atomic mass units, leaving 2 AMU for something else. It's hard to account for two atomic mass units in any way other than two atoms of hydrogen. We have a molecular formula of C2H2, acetylene. Let's try another. Let's assume that the molecular ion appears at 128. What do you think this molecule is? When the mass gets bigger, the problem gets much tougher. But what if I told you this molecule has 10 carbon atoms? Then what would you say is a reasonable molecular formula? If we have 10 carbon atoms, then we can account for 120 AMU. That leaves eight mass units to account for. If we assume now that we are not dealing with an organometallic compound, then we can infer that eight implies eight hydrogen atoms. So we have C10H8, which is the formula for naphthalene. I hope that you see that knowing the number of carbon atoms is a very valuable clue in generating a reasonable molecular formula. 
Let me show you how to find the carbon number. When we began looking at the spectrum, I asserted that the peak at 128 was associated with the molecular ion. We might think that the molecular ion ought to be the heaviest ion in the spectrum, since everything else is a fragment of that parent ion. Well, it ought to appear at the high end of the mass scale, but if we look closely at the spectrum, we see a small peak just to the right at 129 AMU. For ease of reference, let's refer to the mass of the molecular ion as M, and the peak to the right as M plus 1. This satellite peak is associated with versions of the parent molecule that contain one heavy isotope of carbon. Here is a table of the most common elements found in organic molecules. Each of these elements, the lightest isotope, is the most abundant of the common isotopes for that particular element. The table is telling us that for every 100 atoms of carbon that have a mass of 12, there are approximately 1.1 atoms of carbon-13. So what is the implication? In a spectrum of methane, we would expect to find a peak at M plus 1 that is 1% as tall as the molecular ion. In ethane, or any other molecule with two carbons, we would expect the heavy isotope peak to be 2.2% as tall as the molecular ion at M. A three-carbon molecule would have a M plus 1 peak that is 3.3% as tall. A four carbon molecule will have an isotope peak that is 4.4% as tall, and so on. We can say then that the relative intensity of the M plus one peak compared to the molecular ion intensity times 100% is equal to 1.1% times the number of carbon atoms. Or said another way, the number of carbon atoms can be calculated from this ratio times 100% divided by 1.1%. Let's see how that applies to the last example. Here we have a cluster of ions at the high mass end and the relative intensities. We divide the 10.9 by 100 and multiply by 100% over 1.1% and we get approximately 10 carbon atoms. Real data have some uncertainty associated with them, so we don't expect an exact integer. When the signals are weak, the relative uncertainty may be large and we have to be prepared to be flexible in our conclusions. Let's see what else we can learn from this table. Notice that there are a few other elements that have Fe isotopes that are one atomic mass unit higher than their most abundant forms. If we expect that these elements are present, they will contribute to the intensity at m plus 1, and we should be ready to correct for that contribution before calculating the number of carbon atoms. We will see an example of this later. Chlorine stands out from the other elements in that it has a heavy isotope two units higher than the most abundant isotope at 35. It's also distinctive because the heavy isotope is practically one-third as abundant as the light isotope. This leads to an unmistakable pattern in the high mass cluster in which a peak one-third as tall as the molecular ion appears at m plus 2. With two chlorine atoms per molecule, we see a pattern with a strong m plus 2 peak and a significant peak at m plus 4. Their relative intensities also fed a distinctive pattern, roughly 10 to 6 to 1. Here we see a molecule with three chlorine atoms, and we see a combination of isotope peaks, which represents molecules with one heavy chlorine, two heavy chlorines, and three heavy chlorine atoms. This also follows a distinctive pattern of intensities. The intensity pattern for the distribution of heavy isotopes can be predicted from their natural abundances. There are several websites that have free calculator programs where you can predict the distribution of isotopes for a given molecular formula. Here is a good link. Notice that bromine is also a special case. Its population is a nearly one-to-one -one mixture of isotopes with mass 79 and mass 81. This fact also leads to an unmistakable signature in the mass spectrum. Here we see the molecular ion at 156 units and a peak two units higher with almost the same intensity. With two bromine atoms in a molecule, the probability is greatest for the molecule to have one heavy atom and one light bromine atom. The pattern looks very much like a triplet in an NMR spectrum. The tall peak at 236 is actually the M plus 2 peak. Notice the doublet at 155 and 157. This is a strong clue that the fragment at 155 contains one bromine atom. A few other 
elements have heavy isotopes that are two units above the most abundant isotope. Sulfur is a good example. It has a small but very significant contribution to the M plus 2 peak. Oxygen is a very important element in organic compounds. It has a very tiny contribution to the M plus 2 peak. This signal may be useful when the molecular ion is very intense. Usually, it is only suggestive. Nitrogen contributes weakly to the M plus 1 peak. Although its contribution is tiny, it should be subtracted out before calculating the number of carbon atoms. There's a very useful concept that we can employ with regard to nitrogen. Take a moment to look at this table. Pause the video and see if you can see a pattern in the data. All of the compounds in the first column have an even molecular weight and contain no nitrogen atoms. All of the compounds in the middle column contain one nitrogen atom and exhibit an odd molecular weight. All of the compounds in the right have an even number of nitrogens and once again exhibit an even molecular weight. So here is an important principle. An odd molecular weight indicates an odd number of nitrogen atoms. Let's apply these ideas to a few example spectra and generate reasonable molecular formula for each. We start by identifying the molecular ion. If it is present, it should be in the cluster of ions at the high mass end of the scale. Let's assume that the tallest peak in this cluster is the molecular ion. Note, that is not always the case. With the molecular ion at 68, the peak at 69 must be the M plus 1 ion. Let's use their intensities to calculate the number of carbon atoms. We get 3.8, so we assume 4 carbon atoms. This accounts for 48 atomic mass units, leaving us with 20. We don't see any indication of chlorine, bromine, sulfur, or silicon from the M plus 2 peak. The molecular ion has an even mass, so we can rule out nitrogen. Fluorine has an atomic mass of 19, but if an atom of fluorine were present, that would leave us with only one atomic mass unit and consequently one hydrogen atom. Let's assume that we have an oxygen atom. That leaves us four atomic mass units that could be explained by four hydrogen atoms. So we have a molecular formula of C4H4O. A quick test of the plausibility of the molecular formula can be made by calculating the number of rings plus double bonds that this formula implies. You may have seen this concept before. Sometimes it has been called the number of double bond equivalents. We calculate the number of double bond equivalents by taking the number of carbon atoms, subtracting half the number of hydrogen atoms, adding half the number of nitrogen atoms, plus 1. If this is a plausible molecular formula, then this number should be an integer. In this case, we get 3, a reasonable number. Indeed, this is the spectrum of furan. We'll save the discussion of fragmentation processes for another lesson. Let's work a couple more examples. Here we have the high mass cluster ions in the table. We might guess that the tallest peak in that group will be the molecular ion. If so, the peaks at 73 and 74 must be the result of heavy isotopes for this particular formula. The calculation for carbon number gives us 3, so subtracting 36 atomic mass units from our molecular weight gives us 36 atomic units unaccounted for. We see no evidence of chlorine or bromine, sulfur or silicon in the M plus 2 peak. We have an even molecular weight, so we would expect an even number of nitrogens. Since zero would also be an even number, let's first try the idea of no nitrogens. We could have two oxygen atoms, which would account for th uh, 32 atomic mass units, leaving us four to be explained by four hydrogen atoms. Calculating the double bond equivalence gives us two, a reasonable number. Acrylic acid would be one structure that we might draw that meets all of these criteria. Let's go back to the possibility of two nitrogen atoms. We get a difference of eight atomic mass units, which suggests eight hydrogens and a molecular formula of C3H8N2. Once again, the double bond equivalence is an integer. So we have two possible formulas that seem to fit the data for the high mass cluster. In order to decide which is the better choice, we will need to look at the fragmentation pattern for each structure that we can draw for these two formula. That we'll take up in another lesson. Let's try another.
Once again, we look at the high mass cluster. We'll consider the possibility that the tallest peak is the molecular ion. Using the intensities for the M plus 1 peak and the molecular ion, we calculate five carbon atoms, which accounts for all but 30 atomic mass units. But in this case, we have a fairly strong M plus 2 peak. It's certainly not the result of chlorine or bromine, but it could indicate the presence of sulfur. If an atom of sulfur were present, then it would contribute to the M plus 2 intensity a signal of 4.4% as intense as the signal of the molecular ion. 4.4% of 75.2 would give us a signal of 3.3 units, and that jives very well with the intensity of the peak at mass 92. Also notice that a sulfur atom will contribute to the M plus 1 peak, so if one sulfur atom is present, we would, should adjust the intensity for the M plus 2 one ion before calculating the number of carbon atoms. We see that the sulfur would contribute 0.6 to the intensity of the M plus 1 ion. So we correct the intensity at M plus 1 by subtracting 0.6 from the value of 4.1 in order to calculate the carbon number. This gives us a value of approximately 4. Subtracting out the mass of 4 carbons and 1 sulfur leaves us with 10 AMU which suggests the formula of C4H10S. Calculating rings plus double bonds gives us a number of zero, a very good number. Indeed, this is the spectrum of diethyl sulfide. A take-home message here is that there is some uncertainty in the data that we use for calculating the number of atoms of the various elements in our molecular formula. Consequently, the process is somewhat similar to solving a crossword puzzle. We need to be flexible with our choices and be ready to give up on an earlier idea if it conflicts with other information. Another helpful approach to finding the best molecular formula is the consideration of high accuracy mass data, that is, mass assignments for ions and fragments that are accurate to the nearest 0.001 atomic mass units. That sort of data can be provided by high-resolution mass spectrometers or quadrupole instruments using a special calibration process. We will take up this topic in another lesson.